Uh, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come again to your word. What a wondrous thing that uh, we can spend the whole of this day talking about you, speaking of your word, hearing it preached, and uh, worshipping you in spirit and in truth, we would hope, we would pray that you would enable us to do that. But also that we can speak of the gospel, that by which we're saved and that by which others are saved. We pray that it would be powerful in the spirit this evening. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The apostle said, our word came not in word alone, but in power and in the Holy Ghost. And so we, we confess our reliance on you, but we ask that you would cause your word to penetrate beyond our minds and into our very hearts, into our very souls, for your glory's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Romans 8 is a well-known chapter. I'm going to preach uh, the gospel from it. A glorious end is the title, if you want a title. And uh, I preach the gospel every Sunday evening. Um, whether there are saved, unsaved people there or not, because the gospel is a thrill to the heart of the believer. Um, so if you're saved, as we look through this, uh, and as we seek to apply it to any here who might be, I don't know you, if any here are unsaved or not Christians yet, uh, then if you're saved, remember that this same gospel is in some way the means of your salvation and should cause you to rejoice. Now at the end of Romans chapter eight, it flows like a, what we might say, a majestic waterfall over a beautiful, but sometimes very dangerous precipice. Uh, there's a lack of condemnation, there's deliverance and freedom from the charge of sin, but there's also danger as the warning of tribulation, of distress, of wants, even death, is contemplated as a possibility due to our faith in Jesus Christ. So when we preach the gospel, we're not saying come to Jesus and all your problems will be over. We're saying come to Jesus and you may well face a whole different host of problems. Not a very appealing message you might think, but that's what the apostle uh, tells us here. Uh, the question is, uh, should we fear this? Should we be afraid of this? Should we doubt God when things are hard and difficult? Well, the apostle says not. Uh, and we see that in verse 18. He accounts such things as a small thing. He says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to what we have to come. And, of course, the Apostle Paul suffered greatly. He suffered prison, he suffered chains, he suffered beatings, and he suffered death. But he said it's nothing compared to what I will have when I'm absent from the body and presence with the Lord. You see, it all comes down to comparisons. The comparisons of what we might face in time are set against what happens to us in eternity. For, for, for the Christian, for all here who belong to Christ, the measure of life goes far and beyond the trials of this fallen and time-limited world. Indeed, we're told we are more than conquerors. In all these things, we are more than conquerors, says the apostle. He's fully persuaded that it's all worthwhile. I, I don't know what trials you might be going through. I don't know what difficulties you face what temptations you wake up with. But they're nothing compared to the glory to come. Uh, and we can be more than conquerors through him who loved us. As we look to, etern as we look to eternity, we find that being a Christian is the most secure situation that anyone can find themselves in, that nothing of this world can damage us, harm us, or shake us from our standing in Christ Jesus. Of course, uh, if all our eggs are in the basket of this world, 
of this life as many people's uh, lives are held the preciousness of their life is in this world it may have a different appeal the gospel may have no appeal Why would I want to come into a religion that offers me a possibility of persecution when I have all of this? A lot of people think like that. But time is a groaning world waiting for the Lord's return to put it, this Humpty Dumpty of a broken world back together. If the world was one nation, if all the nations in the world joined together uh, and there was one ruler and one nation, uh, even then, all of its power, all of its might couldn't fix your problem, our problem. See, the problem we face goes deep into the heart of who and what we have become because of sin. It, even worse than our actions, our actions are the fruit of sin. Sin is, sin is something that is inside of us. It's part of, it's accounted to us, imputed our nature. So even worse than our actions is the separation that has come about between humanity and God. Life is broken. Now people like to say, well, surely this little baby is good or that little child's good or, but life is broken. We're broken. We're damaged from the moment of our conception, born in sin, shaped in iniquity. Uh, it's nothing to do with the act of conception. That is the nature of our being knitted together in the womb, uh, born in sin, shaped in iniquity. We're damaged from the moment of our conception by the deadness of our spirit and our spiritual inability. Jesus said, you must be born again of the Spirit of God. Why did he say that? Because that part of you that could have a relationship with God is born in deadness. You, you, you were lost. You, you didn't become, if you were a Christian, you didn't become a Christian because you saw some good in Christ or had some insight into God. You he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2, verse 1. We're broken, we're damaged, and we have spiritual inability. We're born without God, we're unable to know God unless he reveals himself to us by his spirit, by grace. Are you saved through faith that none of yourself is the gift of God? And the gospel makes no sense to us until it happens. We understand what it says, But is it really worth the risk of losing out in time? What if all of those things mentioned happened to us? What if we're stuck in verse 35 and 36? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall, we're stuck in tribulation or, or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or, or peril of sword or sword. It, it, is Paul just speculating there? Well, no, he says, for as it is written... For your sake, for, for the sake of God, for the sake of Christ, we are killed all day long. Accounted as sheep for the slaughter. It's a dangerous business, being a Christian. What if we're stuck there? Surely the wise thing is to turn back. But according to Paul, turning back is not on the cards. Not an option. We are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Do you feel like a conqueror? Do you feel that you are an overcomer in Christ? There is a fundamental change that takes place when we put our trust in Jesus that no matter what we are faced with, and even if we falter at the first, think of, of Peter when he denied Christ. He faltered. And when he was renewed, he was valiant. Even if we falter at the first, we will stand, and having stood, we will stand again and again and again because the end of our faith far outweighs anything that we might have to face in the journey of faith. How do we face problems? We look to the end of our faith. We look to what is to come. To know Jesus 
Mark this. To know Jesus is to know the best thing in life. And it will carry you to a better life in eternity. To know Jesus is to know the best thing in life. To refuse Jesus is the most foolish thing that anyone can ever do because it takes them beyond hope and beyond God. Heaven is a place that God has created and built at great cost, personal cost you might say, as an eternal home for all who come to him in Jesus. Its walls, its floors, its buildings and bricks, they are all held together by God's love as seen in verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, a father, God the father, who did not spare God the son, but delivered him up for us, all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He who did not spare his own son. Now often, and I'm sure if you've done any outreach at all, you will have come across this at some time, but often people would look at the personal cost before coming to, or more often refusing to come to God in Christ. What will I lose? What will I gain be Will it be enough to compensate for what I lose? Let me tell you this, such thinking will never result in salvation because it starts with self. What will I lose? What will I gain? And true salvation always starts with this. I have offended God. I have offended God and need to get right with God. You cannot repent of what you do not know. And we have all sinned. We have all offended God. We have all come short of the glory of God. And we all need or needed to get right with God. And it's this realisation that God is, and that he is holy, and that he is righteous, that all power rests in him, that uh, our salvation depends on him, or that the life I am living can never please God, can only bring his judgment upon me, or that I offend his law, I'm never seeking his presence. Uh, do I really pray? I do not really pray. I, I, I resent church. I go because I have to. Churches are full of people like these. Perhaps the worst of all is when we imagine that we're already good enough for Jesus, and that Jesus is an added extra. I'll be okay. I was brought up in church, I read my Bible, I pray. I'll be okay. Will you? Do you have Jesus? Have you repented of your sin and sought salvation? You see, for those who know the truth or hear the truth and reject it, it will be something like that until the sudden sense that you have a need that is beyond your power to fix. I, I remember, I, I wasn't brought up in church, but I remember when I first realised that, that something was happening and that it was to do with God and to do with Christ. I realised that something that had happened in my life was greater, bigger than the world around me. I realised that God is, and that, and that the life I was living had nothing to do with God. I couldn't fix it. Even all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put this problem together again. I was that broken. Well, God knew my need. And God knows your need. He understands your problem, after all. He saw it happen in the Garden of Eden. He, he saw the fall. He, he made all things and he said, they are good. And, and then Adam took the fruit from Eve and ate of it. And everything became bad. He saw that. He promised to fix it. Almost immediately after it happened, I, I will send a seed uh, the seed of the woman will bruise your head, say. Like he purposed a saviour to defeat sin 
even before it happened. But sin, sin is so evil in the sight of God that to pay its debt and to cover its misery, drastic action would be needed. Such action as we see in verse 32, he did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all. God paid. We were talking this afternoon about God, about uh, the fact that uh, creation is just a small thing compared to God, that God is eternal. He didn't create at the beginning or the middle or the end of his uh, existence because he has no beginning or end. He just created. He is timeless and eternal uh, and greater than all the universe that it is but a, a span of his hand that uh, the nations are a drop in the bucket. And yet he is personal to us. He loved us in such a way as it is everlasting and saving. And he did that by delivering himself or delivering Jesus Christ, the Son of God, delivering him up for us all. That is for all who trust in Jesus and ask for forgiveness and find salvation. It's on the basis of God's triune actions that salvation is purposed and won and made known to lost sinners. From before time, from before time, God purposed and chose for himself a people to be saved in his son. Ephesians chapter 1, chosen in him before, the, uh, uh, before time, before the creation. And the love of God stretches beyond time in every direction because it is his nature to love. Or well, one of the things that we mentioned this morning was that God is love. His nature is to love. Justice and righteousness are also his nature. But sin, sin cannot abide before the light of his holiness. The wages of sin are death. Everything that is promised in those closing verses, everything Paul is persuaded of, is lost to those who remain in sin. And there's no hope beyond time, no avalanche of glory that fills the soul with eternal delights, only lostness, blackness, in the thicket of eternity's absence of any felt presence of God, no eternal love, no eternal joy, only eternal misery. Remember the man in the wedding feast who had no wedding garment, cast into the outer darkness where there was weeping a gnashing of teeth, wailing and misery. You see, we see how terrible sin is by God's own actions towards himself. He did not spare his son. He did not spare him. Instead, he delivered him up for all who come to him in faith. And he will save all who come to him in faith. If you come to Christ in faith, it is because God delivered up his son and drew you to himself. Jesus, Jesus has paid the price of sin. He has paid its wage. The wages of sin is death. He has paid its wage. Its wage is fully compensated for on the body of Christ on the cross. But it is a price. Um, I'll explain this in a moment, but it's a price that must be accepted. People think it's an Armenian. No, it's not an Armenian. You need to come to Christ if you're to be saved. The, the means of your coming might be the work of God, but the coming, you need to move your legs and your lips and your mouth. It's a, a price that must be accepted. An action that must be both acknowledged and purposefully received. You think of Paul on, on Mars Hill. He said, God commands all men everywhere to repent. And yet we're told that repentance is the kindness of God. 
He told them to, to grope for him. In the darkness of their understanding, he's not far from anyone. Grope for him, lest you, in case you might find him. You don't just sit there. Don't just sit there and wait for some kind of fuzzy feeling. Come to Christ. Um, it, it's urgent. very urgent the charge stands against all who refuse Jesus condemnation rests on all who refuse him the tribu tribulations of life will pale into insignificance when set against the tribulations of eternity we see that again in verse 18 and the earth groans Unwillingly, in rumbling agonies and volcanic anger, as sin takes its toll. Verse 20 to 22, for the creation was subject to the fertility, futility affected by sin. It groans and rumbles. And the playground in which sin masquerades as pleasure will not be a forever home or a safe refuge, it will be burnt up with fervent heat, melted. On the cross, uh, do, you, do you think of the cross often? See, on the cross, Jesus took sin's punishment, paid for our sin. I, I remember talking to a man, he said, uh, uh, I don't read the Old Testament, it has nothing to say to me. Um, I don't uh, read the Gospels. I've outgrown the Gospel. I just read the letters of Paul. Um, trying to show that he was some kind of theologian. Well, Paul revels in the cross. Uh, quotes the Old Testament extensively. Our, our faith is a, is a simple thing. It is something that we should often return to the simplicities of it. Uh, and one of the most simplest things for us to understand is the cross. That uh, here is me and here is Jesus on the cross, the paying the wages of sin and my sin is put upon him and his righteousness is put upon me. Uh, we need to think about that because on the cross Jesus took sin's punishment and by his blood, sin is remitted and salvation is won. That should thrill our soul. The blood of his body is shed to pay sin's debt. The pure water of his life is poured out for our sanctification. And we can be clean in every part before God by the washing of the water of his word and by faith in the death of our Saviour. And if you come today, if you have come that is good, but if you haven't, if you come today, you will be saved. If you come today, you will be saved. And if you refuse again, who knows if another opportunity will ever come. See, the Holy Scripture searches the heart. Searches the heart. The Holy Spirit, through the word, searches the heart. Even now he searches the heart. He discomforts us. It's called conviction. Sometimes people think that uh, preachers are just telling them scary stories to frighten them into the kingdom or making extravagant promises to persuade them that what you have is nothing compared to what is to come. It's a message I've been giving you. But that's what the Bible teaches says you're a sinner in need and only Jesus can answer that need. And we see, we see something quite amazing on the cross. You, th you think the cross was a, a method of, of, uh, of um, punishment or, or execution uh, largely used by the Assyrians. I'm not sure whether they invented it or they appropriated it, but they, the Assyrians used it because uh, they thought that impaling people on stakes wasn't painful enough and didn't last long enough. They were a cruel people. 
God so loved you that he came into the world in the body of Christ and died on a cross. There is love in the cross. It's been said by one that falsely claims Christ that the gospel is cosmic child abuse. That if God truly punished Jesus for sin, then it was child abuse. abuse. Uh, some say a message to frighten people into a religious experience so the church can gain power over them. But the gospel liberates. We were chained to sin. We were, there was nothing we could do about it. We were, we were locked in the prison of sin and by the gospel, uh, was it... Uh, Wesley says it, doesn't he? My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. That was the gospel. Not a message to frighten people. It is God's message of hope. And all who come, all who come, and if that's all of you here, you'll be able to uh, uh, acknowledge this, will tell you that it's hope beyond all consequences. What would you give to lose your salvation? What would you receive? What would it take to purchase your salvation from you? If I owned the whole of the world, indeed the whole of the universe, and, uh, and I said, what price for your salvation? What price would you name? You see, there is no price. It is, it, it is priceless. It's hope beyond all consequence. Its promises are pure, its workings are holy, its means are of God, and its love is seen in that Jesus died on the cross. Died for sinners. Whilst we were enemies of God, Christ died. Unconditional love from God who saves and bears our sin upon the body of his son. Christ died, not because there was good in me. He died the just for the unjust, the good for the bad, the perfect for the broken. He died for me. And if you're a Christian, he died for you. Are you persuaded of the worth of Jesus, that he is worth more than all you can desire that is outside of him. That, that if the whole world turned on you right now, that Jesus would be worth more, and to hold on to him or to be held by him would be worth more than anything this world has to offer, that a life lived for his glory is a life that wins eternity, a life that lives beyond time and in the forever peace and joy of his presence. Are you persuaded that to love Jesus is to be eternally loved by him and that nothing can take you away from that? Nothing can separate you from his love. Now, the Apostle Paul... The Apostle Paul would face death for his faith. But he never wavered in his love for Jesus. He knew that when death came, he would immediately be transported out of time and into his presence, absence from the body, presence with the Lord. He, he said uh, that uh, better for him to die, but better for those who he preached to, that if he stayed alive... Um, because it would benefit them. But for himself, he longed for heaven. He longed for that day, willingly delaying it that he might preach the gospel in the hope that others would listen. And we see his heart in the following chapter, uh, chapter 9. He says, I tell the truth in Christ. I'm not lying, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Uh, he goes on to say that it's not possible, but he grieved over the willful ignorance of those who reject Jesus. He understood 
what it would mean to them when they passed into eternity. Do you understand what that means to the lost? Why we preach the gospel? Go into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples. We preach the gospel because we desire that people be saved before it's too late and that they might have heaven's confidence that they will be fully persuaded if you're not a Christian that you will be fully persuaded for nothing of this life is worthy to, to be compared to the eternity to come and that the love of God is made real on the cross of human injustice that led to the death of God the Son. We come to the cross. We came to Jesus. If you're not saved, I plead with you now to come, to forget what you have, the basket of trinkets that make this life seem meaningful to you. It's, it's worthless. It has no lasting value. Give yourself to God. Come to Jesus and plead with him, if necessary, to give you understanding by his spirit. Uh, as I say, I preach the gospel uh, every Sunday evening. I, I get uh, the most unsaved people who come to the church come in the evening. Um, and I figure that if I don't preach the gospel, why would God bring people into the church who are unsaved when they need to hear the gospel? I urge them to come, not to go home and forget their purpose on the way, to come and be saved. Are there any here that know they need saving? Because if you do, do know that, if you haven't, you, you'll know, if you, you'll know if you're saved, you know if you're a Christian, born again of the Spirit of God, if you're not, then now is the acceptable time. No, not tomorrow. Trust not in yourself to remember it, to hold on saying, oh, I'll, I'll think about that. There were, there were a group of people on Mars Hill, Acts 17, Paul's sermon, he says at the end, uh, and some mocked. They just, they just, when they heard of the resurrection, they just laughed uh, and ridiculed him. Some said, oh, we'll hear more later. We have no knowledge of what happened to them, but we don't know that they heard more later, just as Agrippa was almost persuaded as Felix trembled. Delaying is not a wise thing to do. As we close, I want to look again at the words at the end of chapter uh, 8 and read verse 31 to 39. Uh, and as we do so, let us remember that we have either turned away from sin or need to turn away from sin. Forsake or have forsaken all hope in this world and find our hope in Jesus alone. Because only he can save. He alone is the way to heaven and even now he prepares our place. Even now he makes a promise that to those who have come or will come there is no separation, no condemnation. There is justification sanctification and glorification. What then shall we say to these things? What shall we say to the gospel? God's purpose is in life. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Just think of that. We were talking this afternoon about uh, uh, one man with God. If God is for him, he is a multitude. He is a majority. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justified. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us, who shall separate us?
from the love of Christ. Who shall do that? What, what, what shall do that? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Are we scared of them? Well, we don't like them. But will they drive us away from Christ? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded, are you persuaded, that neither, neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, nothing in creation, and everything is created outside of God, so nothing in creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Are you persuaded? Fully persuaded? You see, if you're a Christian, this is what the Word of God tells you. And if the Word of God tells you, then you believe it. If you're not persuaded, then let me say this. Be persuaded of your need of Christ and be sure that if you have come to Christ, be fully persuaded that he will keep you forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to read, sing a hymn, uh, number 540. Uh, sorry, 539. Come, you sinners, poor and wretched, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, join with power. He is able, he is willing, doubt no more. Let's stand together and sing.